Um, thank everybody for being here. Um, crazy and exciting week coming up. Um, our first draft here together uh, as a staff. Uh, I want to start off by uh, thanking our leadership, you know, thanking uh, Coach Vrabel, uh, Chad Brinker, uh, Ryan Cowden, John Salgi, and all of our area scouts. Um, the process has been great. Uh, we've been very collaborative. We spent a lot, a lot of time together, probably too much time together um, at this point. Um, but it was truly, you know, a process in where, you know, myself coming from San Fran, Chad coming from Green Bay, just implementing all the different things that we've learned that we find productive um, in with what we already do here um, allows us to, uh, you know, come together and make this a good process. So um, just wanted to say that to start. Um, and then my only other request for today is for us all to have fun. Everybody looks so tight. Like, let's, <laughs> let's lighten up, man, and have some fun today. Ran, when it came to just the last few months and looking at that first round pick that you guys have, like, what is the collaboration process in that when you know there's so many different ways you could go? It's, you know, putting all of our minds together and figuring out what all those scenarios are. Um, you know, again, uh, this is Chad and I, you know, our first time of really being here um, together. And it's our first time being together, period. So, again, it's, um, you know, figuring out what all the scenarios are, where we're going to come in in those scenarios, how we factor in, and just looking at our board and how we can come away ultimately with a really good football player. What would you say maybe, uh, it's hard to compare, I guess, the past years, but as far as calls you're getting from people interested in your pick, calls you're making as far as interested in moving up or back, or what's that been like? I think it's just everybody being nosy, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, posturing on – you know, from our side and other sides about, hey, I'm thinking about moving, you know, and just everybody trying to figure out what everyone's doing and where you can possibly go um, and where you can possibly add. Um, but again, whether those scenarios truly come into, into shape, who knows, we're probably an error on the side of saying no, <laughs> you know, but I think again, it's everybody calling everybody with all these potential, you know, possibilities. But I think it's, uh, I think Ballard said it to, uh, earlier, something to the effect of, uh, you know, nobody knows what anybody's doing. And um, I think that's really a lot of what it is. I think it's going back to what you in San Francisco <laughs> with, when you made the big trade for Trey Lance and knowing that life does go on and can be successful without all those picks to get your guy. Yeah, and again, it, 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 I would always go back to um, the coaching staff we had uh, in San Francisco and the area scouts we had and the collaborative process that um, that they had together, you know, working to, to help us hit on those, you know, those later rounds in college free agency. Uh, we've implemented the same thing here. Um, our coaches and our area scouts have been, you know, locked in their respective offices these last two weeks, um, fine-tuning that and, um, you know, I guess what we call the bottom of the board and the backboard. Um, so those guys have been working really diligently, you know, to find those players that allow us to supplement, you know, the back end of the roster. At pick 11, I would imagine you don't expect to be there another time. So having a pick like this, like how much does that weigh into – the whole process of possibly getting a franchise quarterback. Right. Uh, so to your point, you you rather be picking at 32, you know, every year. You rather be, you know, at least 31, 32 every year. And uh, for this organization to be picking at 11 with the success that they've had here, it's uh, kind of unprecedented. So um, ultimately, picking that high, you want to be able to come away with what we would call a blue player. You know, a player that's going to come in and contribute um, to you immediately. Um, so with the hopes of never having to pick up this high again. Competitiveness at the quarterback position now with a veteran in Ryan, knowing he's got just one year left on his contract, versus trying to find the next guy, whether it be Malik or a draft pick. I think you know, with Ryan and his uh, respective position, I think it's it, it. The same thing can be said for every position. It's our jo job to do due diligence at every position every year to look to improve it. You know, so it's not an indictment on Ryan or anybody else on this roster. You know, we have to evaluate everyone um, and know where, you know, where we can make ourselves better and give ourselves the best option to put the best 53 on the field. Uh, Borky, you had some new arrivals. I mean, we had three days for the draft. Where do you think uh, this team's biggest needs are right now? Good football players. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're always just looking to add good football players, guys that bring versatility, explosiveness to our team, uh, guys that can score with the football and guys that can take the football away, however that comes. You know, um, 
that's what we've been tasked to do. So I don't think it's going into it with one specific area uh, of need per se. We just need to continue to add, you know, quality players and people uh, to our ball club. Yeah, with regard to running back, in San Francisco, you were part of, of uh, drafting Sermon in the third round, and then Mitchell turned out to be <clears throat> the guy you leaned on, on harder, a sixth round pick. Last year, Davis Price in the third round, and, and Mason got, got more work as an undrafted. What does that tell you maybe about the, the, the value of running backs in the draft and how, how the, the production of what you get out there might not match up with the, with the way you, you stack them? So, Paul, as a former running back, I'm not going to allow you to bludgeon our position and devalue us. So we're not going to let that happen. But it just says it is, you know, you can find value, you know, all throughout the draft. Um, and there's, you know, many ways to find them. And to your point, um, we had success um, hitting on guys early. We had success hitting on guys late. You know, a lot of that was those, the type of people, you know, those players were. They came in, they worked hard, and they were ready when the opportunity came. So, um, you know, I know everyone likes to kill and crush the running back position, but as a former running back, I can't allow people to do that. Um, so this is my first experience with the S2, um, so I'm still learning it, you know, myself. Um, so there's still a space for me to grow. Um, I know we, we use it, um, and we're, you know, working through it. We met with them last week, so I can get a better understanding of how to uh, use it, you know, as a part of our analytical component, you know, to evaluate a player. But myself, I'm still learning. It's my first experience with it, so I've only, um, you know, really been diving into it over the last month or so. Well, it's not, I mean, S2 doesn't just evaluate quarterbacks. You know, it's it's every player. Um, so, again, it's a part of the analytic piece. Um, it's not the end-all, be-all, but it's just another way for us to use and evaluate players. And whatever the test scores are, they are what they are, and it makes us go back and do homework, you know, whether one way or the other. What does it mean to you that Brock reportedly scored the best of all the quarterbacks last year, and then you saw in San Francisco how he processed the game as a rookie? Um... Again, I'm hearing that Brock is – it doesn't surprise me. But I think more than anything, you have to know the human that Brock is, right? Like Brock knew that he wasn't the tallest, the fastest, or had the strongest arm. But I legitimately saw this kid prepare every game. You know, as you know, you hear it all the time. You know, you hear guys say, I'm preparing as if I'm going to be the starter, right? I saw him do that. His seat was right across the row from mine. So whether he was inactive or active – on our flights to away games, he put in the work. So I don't know if the uh, S2 picks that up, you know, but I, I saw the, the work and the type of human he was that I think supersedes any type of cognitive testing. If you're making a trade for a veteran, uh, how big an element of, of it is you, as you consider that, the fact that you might have to fit in a $10.5 million base salary, a $27 million <laughs> base salary, $13.6 million base salary. I'm laughing because uh, Paul and I, we went through this at the combine. Was it no, it was was a combine or owner's meetings? I think it was owner meetings. So we, we have financial flexibility uh, to make moves if we need to. How does your client deal with a guy that has base salaries like that? Of, of specifically $10.5 million? 27, 13.6. <laughs> can, can you give me the stats for that hypothetical player from last year? Well, those are the three guys <laughs> that have big numbers. That are, two of them are I'll say it this way, right? So if you're, if you're trading a player, no matter what their salary is, it's uh, really up to the team that's trading for them and their comfort level, right? Because if you're trading them, you're trading them as is. So I don't think that would fall on us as to the comfort level of the contract. It would fall on the team that's trading for them. Does that traditionally go down in a way where you give permission for somebody to negotiate where they could get a number into a manageable situation before you pull the trigger? Again, for us, traditionally, if you're trading a player and the player is aware that the trade is going down and you give them the permission to talk. And from there, you let them work on their piece of the deal as long as we have our agreement in place. From, from a cap standpoint, the ramifications of that, how much notice would need to be go into making something like that happen? Because if you're, if you're on the clock and somebody calls and says, we'll take player X off your hands and, and all, I would think that the, the contract would have to be worked out in advance. Yeah, well, for us, uh, we, 
the job that Vin and Chad do, again, we've been working through every scenario you know, possible. Um, Adam and Matt and our uh, analytics team have done a really good job. They built, they just built out a um, basically like a salary cap depth chart. So we're able to just, it's a simple click, click and add, and then we have, you know, contract addition and uh, deductions. So it wouldn't be that hard of something to work through um, with any player contract um, because we have the component built to where we'll know, you know, what those uh, salary cap ramifications are. Multiple guys from different organizations all come together and do this first draft. What sort of ideas have you heard from other people that either you a hadn't thought about before, or just a, way, a better way of improving how you want to do things? I think the biggest thing, you know, because in San Francisco, um, we had such great leadership, um, you know, with the guys at the top. Um, but one of the things that you know that we're doing here is uh, we're making it a really more inclusive um, situation, uh, where we get to hear, you know, our coaches' voice. Uh, where we have a separate meeting just for the coaches to kind of speak their piece on the players. And then we also have a separate meeting for, you know, the scouts and everybody's in the room, you know, with each other. So we get to hear, you know, how coaches see players. You get to hear how, you know, scouts see players. And I think making it more collaborative gives people more ownership into the players that we're bringing in. As you go through the process, like meeting with these quarterbacks and things like that, like how, how do you go about evaluating and picking up things that you may not have seen know when you watch their film? I think with the quarterback position, it's one of those that you really need to get in front of them um, and get a feel for them. Um, hence why I was at the pro days I went to. Um, as a part of my job, I went to Kentucky this year. I went to Ohio State this year, but I didn't get to get into Bama. I didn't get, it, get to get into Florida. So being there, being able to see those guys up close and personal. Um, again, I think I said it somewhere before. Um, at the combine for juniors, that's your first exposure to them. That's an uncomfortable environment. For the seniors, your first exposure is at an all-star game, uncomfortable environment. I think it's key to see them in their environment, you know, that they've spent the last three, four, and five years in, get to see them in their comfort zone, get to see them with their teammates, and to see how people interact. So I think you, that's where you really get to see from quarterbacks, like their leadership style and what they could bring to your organization. And then when you're watching you know, like you, you take a guy like Levis who has 23 interceptions over the last two years. Like, how do you go about? Okay, what's the reason for this? H how did that happen? Like, how do you weigh in? You know, factors with those type of things. Those things you gotta, you know, you have to have an understanding of what they're trying to do offensively. It could have been a, a million things that could have happened that could have led to those turnovers. You don't want to always, you know, charge that that one person uh, with said turnover. Um, however, you just you got to work through it. And then when you get your hands on the player, like, hey, let's talk through these situations and what happened here and hear their explanation for it. Just think about the tight end group, particularly the, 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 the inline gang of this group. Of this draft class? Um, I think there's some value there. Um, you know, tight end is one, uh, position is one of those ever-evolving positions. Uh, right, so more guys that are more athletic, these converted wide receivers that are playing it more. So the guys that um, most guys, because of the spread offenses, haven't been charged with blocking. So for us, we just want to see want to. You know, as long as you show the want to and the willingness, you know, with our coaching staff, we feel like we can make you, you know, into a better blocker as long as you have that willingness and the want to. How people have talked about over the years of the draft is, you know, you don't draft somebody that doesn't fit what you do. You don't draft a zone corner if you're a man team, things like that. But with the quarterback position, everything has changed so much in the college game. Do you have to evaluate these guys differently, maybe coming out now than you did 10 years ago when most guys were pocket passers? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's evaluate them differently. Um, you just have to see what concepts carry over you know, to what you do. And then, again, once you get them in front of you, now you can talk concept-wise and see what they know from a processing you know, standpoint, you have to understand that, you know, most of these offenses um, nowadays, it, j it just allows in college, it allows for guys to play quicker and sooner, right? So you condense some of the um, some of the verbiage and wording. And some of these guys are operating off of, you know, the signs and the boards and have never really operated in a huddle. So, you know, there's going to be growth, you know, in those places. Um, but more so, you just look for the carryover. Um, in terms of uh, schematics and concepts and see how they process that. If they can, if they can handle that and, you know, they have their uh, attributes that makes them good quarterbacks and it should be fine. Could you use all 30 of your pre-draft visits and, and what do you hope to accomplish in those? I mean, I guess everyone's different. Some of them, maybe you're getting more informational guys or some of them ruling guys out or 
some of it having to do with medical or what, what kind of is the big picture of bringing a guy in? I think the big picture of bringing a guy in is just, again, getting your hands on him. The more exposures you can get to the, you know, to the player, you know, figure out, again, these guys are not playing football anymore again until they get to this level, so the tape is the tape, you know, and you'll hear me say it all the time. I, I'd rather get to know the person. Um, I can go sit and watch the tape the next six hours and figure that part out, but we need to make sure that we're getting the right people um, in here and in this building and in this community. So part of it is learning the people. And then for those non-combine guys who you haven't seen, it's getting the medical, you know, figuring that part out and making sure that we have hands on them so we can, you know, better surround them. What's been the toughest part to gauge at the quarterback position in your experience over the years? <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Um, the toughest part to gauge um, is really more so the carryover from you know schematics what they know and you know again it's th this is all predictive you know we're all you know taking a shot is playing the lottery and hoping that you win and that you hit on someone um, you know quarterbacks generally come in a little wired different you know and I, I think on some level whatever you know as long as they're willing to put in the work you know and 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 they work extremely hard and they have some leadership qualities yeah, that everybody may not end up being a Hall of Fame quarterback, but I think there's some level of success that could be had at the position. Uh, when you look at the Tennessee Volunteers offense and evaluate quarterback and receiver, is it more challenging because of some of the things they do that don't really translate to the NFL game? No, I think as long as you know, um, you know what those concepts are and what their reads are, I think it gives you um, a little more clarity as to where you may say, oh, he didn't run the route, you know, but if you have a better idea of why, that was done, then I think you, it, it gives you a different view to see it. Brandon, how, do you, how do you balance the value of a player against um, a play a guy at a position of need, especially early in the draft when, as you said, you need a, a blue guy who's going to have to come in and have a high impact? I, I think that's, um, again, that's a good question. I, I think in most cases, obviously, you want to take care of a need. You know, and you hope that the best player available is at, a, is at a position of need. But you also don't want to reach, you know, for a guy. You have to trust your board. You have to not only have them stack right vertically, but you have to have them stack right horizontally. And you just have to trust the process and just know that, understand that, hey, this player here is available, but then you know a little bit further down you can get, a, you know, an equal player um, that you don't have to necessarily reach for. Is that a way to necessarily simulate that frenzy, but – is there anything you're doing heading into your first draft to get accustomed to what that might be like, having to field all the calls and deal with everything draft night? I got away this weekend. <laughs> um, went and visited my dad down in Arkansas and, you know, saw some family and didn't have to think about football so I can have a clear mind, you know, heading into this week. And, you know, more than anything, just trusting the process. Like I just said, we have really good people here um, who've done a ton of work. You know, I don't have all the answers. I don't expect to have all the answers. So just being able to trust our staff and trust the way that we've done things. And I think once we do that, we'll, we'll be fine. You know, I've never done this before. Um, like I said, I've leaned on, you know, resources, um, Kwesi Adolfo Mensa and Martin Mayhew and John Lynch and, you know, John Schneider and guys that I've, you know, built relationships with throughout the years and, you know, lean on those guys for, uh, for help and for advice on how to navigate this first one. But, you know, more than anything, just trusting, you know, my training and trusting the guys that we have around us. Brandon, what has been the most difficult part of this draft process for you so far? Um, I don't want to say that there's been a, a difficult, you know, part of the process. It's just, uh, it's all been new and just trying to embrace it all and, you know, taking in, um, you know, you only get to have a first draft one time, you know, so just trying to take it in and, you know, not be too hard on myself. And I, some of the best advice I got when I got the job was get sleep, you know, and that was from Andrew Barry. Um, he was like, you have time to do it all. So that was the biggest thing I always kept in mind. And like, hey, I'm going to get some sleep. And there were a couple sleepless nights. There was a night last week I woke up at 3.43 in the morning, like, who the hell's going to be there at 11? You know, and then, you know, just working through that in my head. And, you know, I know Chad Brinker probably puts his silent notifications on because if I get up in the middle of the night, you know, I might, you know, fire off a couple texts, you know, to him just stuff that's on my mind. And it's – um we actually just moved into the same apartment building. So I told him the rest of this week he's in trouble. So we're going to have, you know, two, three o'clock in the morning meetings if I wake up in time. How 
How come Mike didn't join you, or did you tell him he couldn't? No, I told Mike he couldn't because um, I didn't want you and him arguing. <laughs> now, um, you know, we got players in, um, coaching staffs in, and, um, you know, Mike and I, again, we talk every day, um, talk a lot. Um, and so it, it wasn't a real need for him, you know, to be here. Man, you mentioned about the, you know, quality of a person off the field and getting to know a person like that. So what's your evaluation process of a guy that maybe coming into the draft has – some issues off the field, but could be a very high caliber guy. Like, would you risk that type of a situation or is it just getting to know them in your own opinion? I'll say something that Mike says um, all the time, you know, that good people make mistakes. And I think, you know, if it's, um, you know, and good people might make two mistakes. You know, I, I think again, it's feeling like, is this a good person? And can the person own up to that mistake and work to fix it? you know, and how things have been since said mistake happened. You know, at the end of the day, you want to have good people. Um, you know, when you think about it, I lean on some advice I got from a friend, uh, James Jones, and the, uh, for the Phoenix Suns, and he has a rule. It's called a 21-3 rule, right? So in the NBA, you only get them in their building for three hours a day, and the other 21, they're, you know, they're people. So you're an actual person longer than you are a player because we all see them as players 24 hours a day you know so they spend more time in the community and away from this building as people you know than they do in this building I think you tend to get them on their best behavior here you know and so we want to make sure that we're putting productive citizens out in the community that can you know not only add something to our building but to the community as well you get any free advice from people see on the street on who you should pick <laughs> oh all the time you know I, I get everything um from who to pick, who to trade back to, um, who to trade, you know, who not to trade, you know. So it's – oh, I it, without question, is it's a question about Derek. You know, I've had – you know, I've had a – I was at an event and I was taking a picture and, you know, I had my arm around the lady and take a picture and she leans in, you better not trade Derek. <laughs> and she, she, she scared the hell out of me because it came from like a motherly authoritative – place and, and I was just like yes ma'am <laughs> you know I don't say anything I just smile and kind of nod and hope that somebody else comes in and saves me <laughs> you know about about Derek no no I mean there's things I want to say that I won't because I got Robbie standing to my left um you know I mean it is what it is I you know it's it's a part of the job you know I know people have their job to do to speculate and you know, put things out and hope that it stick and hope hope that they're right. But um, I'll just lean on it this way because I've said it before. Um, we won't do business in public. We haven't. You know, you lean to we were trading Jeffrey Simmons. You know, we were doing all these things. And the entire time of us trading Jeffrey Simmons, we were working on a deal. You know, and then we got the deal done and every all of that talk went away. You know, so um, I always lean on taking care of the player, taking care of their families. I don't think it's fair to discuss, you know, publicly. Um, because not only do the players have to deal with it, but they got to receive these calls from their family members about what's going on in their personal life and in their career. And, you know, if I asked any of you in the crowd right now, like, what's your contract status? Are you going to be back with your publication next year? You're not going to want to have that conversation with me, you know. So I try to protect the guys as much as I can. And, you know, I think we've been transparent you know, about, you know, things that have come up and, you know, um, you know, even down to KB, you know, when that report came out that he asked to be released or traded or whatever it was, and that simply wasn't true. And yes, we did ask him, you know, for a pay cut. That was, that was correct, you know, but at the same time, you know, all our dealings are with the players and our players know where we stand with them. And so it's not a need to kind of touch on it. And if there's something that comes up, you know, we'll, We'll address it as it comes, but I don't feel the need to kind of discuss, you know, their personal business publicly. You had mentioned earlier about stacking your board with the receiver position. Like, do you look at it as being top heavy, or do you feel like you could get a quality player all the way through day three and, and even, you know, undrafted free agent? You know, that's value everywhere, you know, in this draft. You know, one thing, you know, you look at it now um, in college football, it's a, it's a lot of talented receivers, right, because it's a passing game. You know, everyone's spread. And so most teams play with four or five receivers, you know, at a time. So um, there's value, you know, from the top all the way down. So how is this draft weighted at receiver more 
big physical guys or more jackrabbits? <laughs> I think there's a variety. You know, you have what you're looking for. You know, um, you know, I don't want to name players specifically, but you can imagine there are the big, taller guys that can go up and get the ball. There are the bigger physical guys. You have your slot guys that can win, that can create separation laterally, and then you have your jackrabbits that can, you know, align anywhere, do a bunch of different things, and get the ball in their hands and make plays. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a it's a variety all the way throughout. Can you play with four or five at a time? You got to ask Tim that question. <laughs> Does that make it any easier for you when the, when things when the bullets start to fire on Thursday night as to which way you want to go, or, or are you still in sort of watching what happens in front of you play out each time? No, you just got to watch it, and um, you know, like I said, we're going to surround it. Uh, we've been doing the work, been doing the research on where teams ahead of us could go um, potentially, and where teams below us within range, you know, could um, can go as well as the teams who may look to trade above us, you know, ex expecting us to do something. So you have to do that part of the research. And so when it's t when you're on the clock, you know, you're comfortable. And again, the way the board stack, vertical, then horizontal, you just got to trust it, you know, and trust how you have your board stacked and, you know, not try to overthink it, you know, and reach, you know. So, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to lean towards that and just trust our board and trust our process. Are you fiddling at this point or is the thing set? Um, I mean, there might be a couple minor, you know, tweaks here and there um, as we finish gathering you know, the rest of the information. But, you know, at this point, you know, you pick a day. Uh, even when I was, you know, just a director of pro or director of player personnel where you have to just tune out the noise for the rest of the week to stay out of the rumors and just trust your information and trust what you know. Uh, so there will be minor tweaks, but there won't be any big swings. Looking on the personal side of these guys and the rumors that come out about their contracts, and it seems like it's been very persistent with rumors about Ryan, including yesterday on SportsCenter. Can you make it easier on the player, in this case on Ryan, to shut it down and say, you know, like Ryan will be the quarterback this year? So just to let you guys in, Ryan and I had a conversation back in February that was between Ryan and I and, and Ryan and our organization. So Ryan knows where he stands with us, and that's really all that matters to me. You had Debo Samuel in South Carolina, or in uh, San Francisco, excuse me. Are there any guys without naming names in this draft that you feel like might be a guy that you could get that kind of have the same skill set or similar that could come here and, and potentially do what he does in various positions? Yeah, there are a couple guys, you know, in this draft, whether it's at the receiver position or the running back position. You know, I'm sure if Debo heard this, he would be mad about me referring to him as a running back. But um, I like he he coined a phrase called wide back. You know, is what he likes to call himself. So there are players in this draft that can do, you know, similar things to him that are at the running back position as well as the receiver position. Are there enough, would you say, Ryan, this, uh, the strengths of this draft at each position? Um, you know, the wide receiver class is, you know, um, deep. Uh, the quarterback class, you know, is deep um, as well. You know, if, if we're leaning on, uh, I think you said, you know, Sports Center. If we're leaning on them, you know, four guys should go, you know, in the top in top ten, and another guy later. Um, and then uh, also offensive line, you know, is a is a pretty deep um, draft in terms of just value. You have enough first round grades on your board that you can comfortably trade back half a dozen spots or so. So you're trying to get me set up, you know. Um, we're comfortable with where our board is. You know, don't want to tip too much, you know, to the people above and below. Um, but we're comfortable that wherever we're picking, we're going to get a player that we like. Talked about, um, lost my question. You talked about um, doing research on the 10 teams ahead of you. Just how much of that is what you were calling being nosy? How much of that is guessing? Just how do you go about doing that? Well, it's all guessing because we don't work for them, <laughs> you know, and we're not, you know, uh, we don't have an intimate knowledge of what did, what we, what they truly want to do. Um, you know, it's really a, a speculation of it all, but that's why we start being nosy, you know, and, and making a cause. And, and everybody, you know, expected. I won't say who the GM is, but every time my phone rings from him, I'm like, oh, this is this is all intel, you know. And he butters you up with the how you doing and how's everything going. It's your first one. And then it's like a little slip of a question in there, and then I just avoid it, you know. Um, but it's it's a part of doing the job. You know, and not only is it myself, but it's our pro staff, 
you know, Brian Gardner and Kevin Turks and Brandon Taylor and Rob, all those guys, you know, they put together a really good team needs book that, you know, myself being a former pro guy, like I used to have to put the book together, you know, so it was good to have that with me this weekend before I left and have that as some reading material. So I uh, feel prepared, you know, and knowing what those, um, what other teams may need, but knowing what other teams may need versus what's available to them when they pick are two different things. You did bring in Anthony Richardson, him and Hooker, and Will Levis. Do you feel like you got to know – you talked about how important the personality was of the quarterback, that you've got to know C.J. Stroud well enough to have that evaluation on him? Yeah, Mike and, um, Mike and Tim spent time with him, um, you know, in Columbus, you know, at the pro day. Um, and they feel, you know, good about oh, – excuse me. Uh, they feel good about, you know, him as a person. Um, and then the other guys, you know, I think we have a really cool process when we come in and uh, for the, our 30 visits. Uh, which I won't say publicly because I don't want anybody else to steal our process, but I feel like we truly get to know, you know, some of these kids. You have some of the kids that come in with, you know, what you have gotten just through your intel, and I, th I feel like some guys you see a totally different person. Now, again, it's a job interview. Everybody's best face is on, but I feel like when we've sat down with these kids, you, f you get the genuine um, person of who they really are, and so – you know, that, that, I, that, I feel, is what makes our process really cool when we bring guys in for the top 30. Hank Dell is a guy who's highly productive, but obviously has some size limitations. <coughs> when you're analyzing that, how do you make that leap of faith or, or decide that, that that's going to cut a guy off? Well, I mean, Tank's a, a really good football player, and I get the, you know, the question about the size, but I like to say Tank's been that size for a long time, and he's been productive you know, at that size. So the size is only a problem for us because clearly it's not a problem for him, you know, because he's still made, you know, plays throughout his time, you know, at the University of Houston against guys that are playing in this league. What was your, I know you, you didn't get drafted, but I was hoping you could kind of talk about your draft, <laughs> draft, draft, week, <laughs> draft, <laughs> weekend, <laughs> draft weekend <laughs> experience, and then maybe, you know, guys who don't get drafted, maybe what do you, what do you tell them? about the process. You hurt my heart, you know. Um, I have my six-year-old, he all the time says, oh, Daddy, you got drafted to the Colts. And I'm like, yeah, I did, <laughs> you know. Um, no, I just tell guys, you know, having gone through that position and, you know, knowing how I felt after the draft at that time um, that I should have been drafted. Now, doing the job I do now, I shouldn't have been drafted. So they were right. Um, however, you know, you just let guys know that, it's been my experience in San Francisco and my experience here that we don't care how you get here. You're here and you earn it out on the grass so you have an opportunity to uh, make the team. And so as long as guys take that approach and use that to fire them, uh, to fire them up inside, then I think there's still a, you know, a way for you to make a name for yourself in this league. But that did hurt a little bit, Jim. Yeah, it sounds like that. <laughs> big, big picture, like basically if, if the opportunity presents itself, like maybe you guys get a quarterback that even this next season, You got to say that one more time. You took me in three different ways, so I had to – one more time. Do you look at this like – there's kind of two ways here. You take a quarterback and possibly you're resetting a little bit. You're probably going to sacrifice some picks. You may have the quarterback sit. You may have to step back a little bit with the new quarterback versus if you don't and you stick with the veterans that you're going to draft to just be as good as possible next season. Is that, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, again, all things are on the table. You know, you don't know how this draft is going to go. Um, again, it's our job every year to look to improve this roster. And, and it's not a year-to-year -year thing, right? We have to see this thing from a macro level and prepare for the future. That's all a part of it. You know, that's what you do when you're constructing contracts. Um, you know, you're not just looking to get a, get a guy signed for this year. You think about future uh, ramifications of the contract and the percentage of the cap that it's going to charge and all those things. So, um you know, we're going we're gonna to be smart about whatever move we make that's going to set us up not only now but for the future as well. When you're looking at players like injuries, you, you know, like how does that weigh in for a guy like Jackson Smith and Jigba who was re really productive, but then he had that injury, knowing the history over the last two years this team has had with injuries. How do you, you know, weigh that off? No, I mean, it's, it's 
you know, not only him, but it's every player, you know, that you get your hands on um, in terms of their injury history. You have to, um, you know, trust Todd and those guys and our doctors. Uh, we had our medical meeting last week. Um, you know, it's one thing if it's been a consistent injury that's, you know, kind of uh, hampered the player's performance over the last three, four, five, six years now. But if it's a one-off and we've seen the player move around since then and our medical uh, team gives us a thumbs up, then we'll be more apt to, you know, make the move as opposed to a person that has a consistent, you know, medical history, probably be a little bit more apprehensive, um, you know, unless we get some good, you know, information. Last time we talked to you, Wesco, Neiman, and Moore have all been signed. Can you kind of give us a Cliff's Notes version on those three guys? I mean, um, all three guys, you know, bring uh, veteran presence. Um, you know, Chris is an explosive uh, receiver um, that has good speed and had a really good year last year. Um, Trayvon is a, you know, a blocker that plays with a, a plays a physical brand of football. And then Neiman is is a guy that has played a lot of football on defense and has played a lot of football on special teams. So just another good depth piece to add to come in and create some competition, uh, not only in the inside linebacker room, but in the special team room as well. How extensive do your pre-draft conversations have to be with other teams regarding moving up from 11, moving back from 11? Because like you said, so much of it is reactionary to what happens in front of you, behind you, what other teams are doing so that draft night, as fast as things are moving, you're prepared to react. Yeah, I think, again, if a team has serious interest, you know, one way or the other, they'll they'll let it be known and you can have more pointed conversations versus just the standard, hey, you're looking to move up, you're looking to move down, and now you know that's the intel question. But I think coming into, you know, uh, Thursday, you'll know the teams that are serious um, that may want to come up to 11. Um, or, you know, come down to 11. You'll have more, uh, more of a serious inclination of who they are, and you'll be more prepared to have pointed conversations heading into uh, the draft night. As you got to meet Will Levis, did you see the mayonnaise go into the coffee, and was that enough to get him off the draft board? Um, I did not, and I'm thankful that I didn't, <laughs> you know. Um, I did, well, I did see the video. Um, I guess it was a TikTok um, where it showed him doing it. That was that was strange to say the least. I don't drink coffee, so I don't like the taste of coffee, so I can't imagine how it tastes with mayonnaise in it. That conversation you said you had with Ryan to where you're comfortable with he knows what you know and what you had that conversation with K B too? Yes, um, I've talked to talked to K B maybe two and a half weeks ago, um, whenever it was. Um been in constant contact uh, with his rep, you know. So again it's um our conversations will be, you know, with those guys. These we've we've had talks, and so it'll, it'll never be a situation where, you know, I, I just charge them to just look at whatever comes out publicly. You know, if it doesn't, if it not, if it's not a direct quote from me, Mike, Amy, or anybody, then nine times out of ten, it's not real. So. How about Derek, who we know isn't necessarily uh, in town as much because he works out elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, we've we've talked. Um, I think I talked to Derek uh, maybe a month and a half ago. Um, I've talked to Todd, um, you know, his agent. But, you know, Derek not being here, I don't think it bothers anybody. Um, I mean, you see the way that guy looks. You know, you know he puts in the work, and he's going to take care of his body and be ready to go. So have no reservations about him being here. 343, what did you tell yourself when you asked who the hell is going to be there at 11? Told myself to take my ass back to sleep. To kind of watch the draft and kind of, you know, do the pick yourself. What are the next couple of weeks, couple of days, going to be like, and what do you anticipate it's going to feel like? Maybe when you're on the clock on uh, Thursday night. Um, I've got a bunch of texts today um, in terms of, you know, am I excited yet? And um, Usually I'm the one, if I know something big is coming up, I'm asking my wife, hey, are you excited? And she's like, don't talk to me about it until it's actually happening. And I think through osmosis, it's kind of rubbed off on me right now. So I'm just trying to really collect the final bit of information and then just shut my brain off, you know, for the next, you know, couple of days till we get on the clock, you know. And so, so I'm not clouded and trying to hear these final rumors and being nosy. Um, but I think once we get on the clock, I think there'll be some nerves, you know, watching how this whole thing shakes out. And um, but you know, at, at that point, it's it's just like a game. Once the ball's kicked off and you've got your first hit, then now it's time to go. Thank you.